Okay, hello everyone. I'm so happy to be here to talk about my research and what I do every day. Um, and I hope it's interesting to you too. So my name is Ashley and I am an ecologist. Does anybody know what ecologists study? Uh. It's a lot of things, so you're probably right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Any ideas? Yeah? Ecosystems? Ecosystems, that's one thing. Yep. Yeah. You were going to say ecosystems too? Yep, absolutely. What are, what are in ecosystems? Yeah? Just everything that includes nature. Nature, pretty much nature broadly. That's, that's exactly right. Ecologists study nature. Um, there are different types of ecologists though. So some of us study individual types of animals and plants or organisms on Earth. So we might study one kind of bird or one kind of salamander. Some ecologists, and those are called population ecologists, they're focused on one type of, of organism. Some ecologists study how organisms interact with other kinds of organisms, and those are community ecologists. So they're focused on maybe predators and their prey, or plants and the things that eat those plants. And then there are ecosystem ecologists, which a lot of these answers kind of seem like you were already thinking about whole ecosystems. Ecosystem ecologists um, study the ways that all of the organisms in an environment interact with the non-living components of their environment. So the things like the air and the water and the earth. I'm an ecosystem ecologist because I've always thought it's really hard to understand one single thing about nature because everything in nature is connected. So I like to focus on questions about how all of the living things in the environment, interact with one another, and with the place where they live. So let's start with the place where we live. Here's Earth as viewed from a satellite. What's all this black stuff all around it? Space, space right? Outer space. OK, here's something fun about space. It's very, very cold. If you were out in outer space, it would be way too cold. You would be frozen. But we're on Earth, where even though it's kind of chilly this morning, it's actually quite warm here, right? Yeah. So how is Earth warm, even though it's floating around in very cold space? The sun's rays. The sun's rays, exactly. The sun sends energy to Earth and warms us up. Okay, but the Earth is like a giant mirror, and all the energy that the sun sends to us the Earth tries to shoot it back out into space. A lot of that energy just bounces right off. So if it was just the sun keeping us warm, that wouldn't be quite enough. We would still be very, very cold. So we need one more thing to help us stay warm. The Earth's core. Okay, there's a lot of heat in the Earth's core. I like where you're going with that. Yep. The atmosphere. Okay. The atmosphere is like a cozy blanket that keeps the Earth warm, right? The atmosphere traps the heat from the sun, so it tries to bounce back out into space, but the atmosphere blocks it from going out, of, out to space, keeps it close to the Earth's surface, and keeps us warm. So the atmosphere is Earth's cozy blanket trapping the sun's energy down here, keeping us warm. Okay, have you heard of a phrase that describes this process? It's called the something effect. The greenhouse effect? That's right. OK, we call this the greenhouse effect because in this way, Earth's atmosphere acts like a greenhouse. Has anyone been in a greenhouse? Yeah, OK. Is it warm or cold inside a greenhouse? Warm, really warm. Even when it's cold outside, it's often warm in a greenhouse. Do you know how that works? Why that happens? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The glass or plastic on the outside of the greenhouse acts like Earth's atmosphere and traps the heat from bouncing away from inside the greenhouse, keeps it in there. So it's the same process, but it's happening. Um, 
instead of in a greenhouse, instead of with glass, <coughs> Earth has an atmosphere that does that instead. So our greenhouse isn't made of glass. Our greenhouse is made of gas. And there's one primary gas in our atmosphere that is the main one that we think of when we think about the greenhouse effect. Do you know it? It might be oxygen. Okay, oxygen. Or it might be um, air. Just air. Okay. All right. I like where you're going. Oxygen's part of it. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. Yay. Okay. Who's heard of carbon dioxide? Yes. All right. We're going to talk a lot about carbon dioxide today. So carbon dioxide or CO2. This is the primary greenhouse gas that keeps us warm. All right, so we need a little bit of carbon dioxide because if there wasn't any carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, it would be so cold here. We could not live. But too much of a good thing is never very good, right? You can have too much and you can have too little. So Earth has a lot of processes in place that keep the amount of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere consistent over time because we want a certain amount, no more and no less. So the first process that really helps us out with this is that plants take up carbon dioxide, they consume it as food. So plants eat carbon dioxide, you can think of it that way. And then living things, including plants, but also animals, produce carbon dioxide. So all these living things are out there producing carbon dioxide and my work is focused on measuring that carbon dioxide that's produced by living things. So where do those living things actually live? Any ideas? Yeah? Inside the on the Earth. On the Earth or in the atmosphere. Some of them are flying around in the atmosphere. Absolutely. Yeah? Everywhere. Everywhere on Earth. That's absolutely true. Yes? Underwater. underwater. Some of them are underwater. Yes. Yes. So living things are all over the surface of the Earth. They're also in the soil. And what I focus on is understanding how the living things in the soil produce carbon dioxide and how that contributes to the carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. So let's talk a little bit about soil now for a minute. Soil has four main components and I study all four of them. So, sorry, my slides got a little cut off, but I think we're gonna be able to work through that. So what is soil, you guys? We have this picture here showing a close-up of some of the components of soil. The first thing you might notice are all these irregular shapes. We have gray and brown and tan shapes. And those are minerals. They're the first component of soil, the primary component of soil. They make up most of what it is. Minerals give soil structure and they hold on to all the other things that are in there and they give roots that plants are growing a place to hold on to. So as an ecosystem ecologist, I'm interested in the minerals in soil for a lot of reasons. And I've done a lot of studies where I was focused on the minerals in soil. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is um, we take soil cores to look at the composition of soil minerals. And we do this um, with a large, kind of like a drill that drills down into the soil and it's like a hollow tube that we put it all the way down and then we pull it back up and there's soil inside that tube. We take it out and we look at it and we analyze the minerals in there and we figure out what they're made out of and how they're interacting with the other components of the soil. So on the left side of this, you can see some soil core samples where the minerals are orange and red they kind of look rusty. And that's because these cores were taken in a place where there's a lot of iron in the soil. So iron minerals form these red and rusty colored um, patches on the soil surface. So that was a study I was looking at the iron type minerals in those um, samples. Those were collected in Georgia, which is a place where it's really hot and really wet. And the minerals have had a chance to break down over time and form the iron oxide that uh, creates these colorful patterns. But I do most of my work around here in Vermont and New Hampshire, and our soils don't really look like that. Our soils are usually kind of a darker brown. 
they have different layers, but they definitely don't have a lot of those small minerals like that that form these um, rusty colored patches in the soil. Instead, we have mostly kind of dark brown soil interspersed with a lot of big rocks. I see some people nodding. How many of you have dug a hole around here and it was mostly rocks instead of soil? If you've ever tried to garden, you know what I'm talking about. You know why all the stone walls surround old fields in this area, because when people were using that land for agricultural reasons, there were just so many rocks. They started piling them up on the edges of the fields, and pretty soon they were using them to build stone walls. So we have a lot of big rocks in our soil, and that makes it kind of hard to sample soil cores around here. So we have to use devices like this one on this image here, which is a gas-powered soil coring drill. Some friends of mine in this picture, we took this uh, gas power drill up. This is on Mount Moose Lock in New Hampshire. And we, to, to sample soil from different uh, research sites that were located there, it was very heavy. It took a long time. And some of the uh, interesting things about the minerals in that location, a lot of big rocks. And we had to use this core, which is very strong, thankfully, because it had to core right through some rocks in order for us to get the samples we needed. So sometimes studying soil minerals can be kind of tough <laughs> because you have to use really powerful tools, you have to cut through big rocks, and hopefully you learn something in the process. So soil minerals, very important, sometimes difficult to study. They're different in different places. The next thing that got cut off on my slide is my favorite component of soil, organic matter. So in between all these irregular shapes on this diagram, you see soil minerals with squiggly lines and little patches of green and brown stuff in between them. That stuff is organic matter. As an ecosystem ecologist, I love soil organic matter and I think about it a lot. One of the things I care about with organic matter is trying to understand how quickly organic matter enters the soil. And organic matter, when we think about it, really what it is, is kind of a fancy word for dead plants and animals. Most of the organic matter in the soil is pieces of old roots and leaves from plants that have um, dropped their leaves or the roots have died, or maybe some dead bugs and things like that. But this organic matter is a really important source of nutrients for plants. So we care about how much is there in the soil and how quickly it's being replenished over time. So one of the things I do when I'm studying organic matter is try to track the decomposition of leaves into the soil. So what happens to all the leaves on the trees in the fall? They fall. That's why it's called fall, right? Exactly. But we look around and we're not swimming in a bunch of dead leaves, even though this happens every year, and it's been happening every year for a long, long time. There are some dead leaves, yes, but we're not wading through chest-high piles of dead leaves. Why is that? Yeah? Because it decomposes. They decompose, that's right. And the process of decomposition is really important to ecologists, but it can be kind of hard to study. So here's one way we do that. This is called a mesh litter bag experiment, and this is part of my graduate school work. I set this up at, at a forest in New Hampshire, and I was tracking how quickly leaves disappeared out of a mesh bag. So what I did was I gathered some dead leaves from the, from the forest floor. I didn't need to bring any. I could have used these ones. So I got some dead maple leaves. I put them in a bag made out of mesh. This is actually just window screen from Home Depot. And I put it, I, I created these little bags by using a heat sealer around all the edges so that I put my leaves inside. And I put a little label in there that said what kind of, what species of leaf they were. In this case, it's a maple. And I gave them a, a sample number. And I weighed those leaves before I put them in. Then I left them out on the forest floor for six months, came back, 
took the leaves back out of the bag and weighed them again. And guess what? They weighed a lot less. There was almost half as much leaf material as there was before. So did it disappear? No. Where do you think it went? It went through the holes in the bag, into the ground, decomposed, yes, and it became soil organic matter. So tracking the decomposition of the organic matter on the forest floor helps us understand how quickly new nutrients are being added to the soil. And what the leaves are going to do then is become organic matter that the plants are going to take up and make new leaves out of. So they're just going to recycle the same material again to make leaves next year. All right, so that's organic matter. The next component of soil is water. So there's a lot of space in between all these minerals, and there's organic matter in there. But if it rains, water is going to flow through all those cracks between the minerals. And soil water is really important because it captures a lot of nutrients while it's flowing through the soil. Things dissolve into it. It helps break minerals down further so that they can become soil um, from rocks to minerals to soil. So water is really important. And we like to study how much nutrients and carbon and other things are in soil water. So we do that by collecting the water out of the soil. And I have a little soil water sample with me. And it's it's kind of dirty, but it's pretty clear. There's no, there's no particles of soil in there, right? So how did I get this water out of the soil without getting any dirt in it? We use a device in this picture here called a lysimeter, which is basically like a giant straw that you stick into the ground, and then you use a vacuum pump to pull the water out of the soil and put it into this flask. It has a filter in there, so it doesn't let any water, uh, any soil particles into the, into the tubes. And then once you have your water out into your flask, you can take that to the lab and you can run chemical analyses on it and figure out how much nitrogen or carbon is in there. And you can also find, just, just knowing how much water you get out of the soil in different places is also important too, because it tells you something about how much water that soil can hold on to. Okay, so I put two pictures of this lysimeter on here because I think it's really cool that they work during the summertime, but they also work during the wintertime because the water in the soil, even in the winter when it's clearly frozen on the surface, the water in the soil is not frozen because the, the snow insulates the soil, keeps it above freezing, and allows that water to stay liquid even during the winter. So that's pretty interesting. Okay, so we've talked about minerals, the organic matter that's in between those minerals, and the water that flows through the cracks in between. But what if it hasn't rained lately, or it's been really dry? What else would be in those cracks? Any thoughts? Yeah? Dirt. Dirt, okay, but in between the dirt. It's so tiny, but there's still some spaces, yep. Roots, roots are the organic matter, yep. Maybe CO2. Well, okay. So CO2 is a gas. So do you think there's gas in the soil underneath us? You do? Oh, well, then you guys, you get it. I was going to say, so it's air. There's air space in there. And it's made up of all these different kinds of gases. But it's kind of strange to think about there being gas under the soil, under us, when we're standing hard on the surface of the earth. But there's a lot of it. There's a lot of empty space in there and it's full of gas. One of those gases is CO2, and that's what I'm mostly interested in when I study soil. Sorry, yeah, you have a question? Um, well, no, just an observation. Okay. When it hasn't rained for a while, yes. and say you took a shovel and smacked it on the ground, it made an indent because all the air, and all the air came out of the ground and it smushed it all together so there wasn't any space on what if you compress the soil really hard so there wasn't any more space for the air? You know, I think you could do that if you had a very powerful machine. And then there wouldn't be airspace. You're absolutely right. 
But normally, in the soil all around us, there is some airspace, and in that air is gas, especially carbon dioxide. Okay, so I use an instrument to measure the amount of carbon dioxide in the soil, um, and it's called an infrared gas analyzer, and I brought one here today for us to demonstrate this. So this is my friend Fiona using an infrared gas analyzer to measure the carbon dioxide in the air, in the soil, in some woods in Massachusetts. And we take that information, we bring it back to our lab, we look at it on the computer, and we can calculate the rate at which carbon dioxide is being released from soil in different places. And that tells us important things about the production of CO2 in different forest types. Okay, so let's, uh, let's, let's do a quick little demo. I need two volunteers to help me with this. Who feels like they can help? Okay, let's take both of you, come, come on right up here. So we're going to look at this instrument that measures CO2. One of you is going to help me look at the numbers on this screen. And I'm going to ask you to call out the number. Okay, so what's that number say right now? 450. 450. It says 450, and that's the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere right now that the machine is measuring. That's pretty typical for the kind of situation we're in right now. Um, and it's, it's, it's nearly the, the global average, sort of, for, for this point in history. So that makes sense. But um, we talked about how living things produce CO2, right? Are we living things? Yes. Yeah, we are. And we produce CO2. Do you know how we do that, where it comes out? Breathing. Breathing, exactly. So I'm going to have one of you breathe on this very gently. You're going to read the numbers. You're going to help me breathe on this instrument. And we're going to see if you produce CO2. All right, so right now the number is 454. It went up a little bit. Let's see how much it changes when you breathe onto this. Do it really gentle. Okay. All right, that'll do it. it didn't go up. Keep watching. Okay, Six. give me one more. There we go. Okay. Oh, oh, what does it say now? Four, six thousand, eight thousand, nine thousand. What the? Nine thousand five hundred, nine thousand four hundred parts per million. So that number just went up a lot. So you're producing a lot of CO2, right? You're bad for the environment. <laughs> okay, so all of us are producing a lot of CO2. Okay, thank you so much for helping me with that. All right, we're going to do one more demonstration. I need two more volunteers to come help. All right. Yeah. Okay. Pink raincoat and you right here. Okay. All right, we're going to let this go down a little bit. So we aren't going to breathe next to it. We're going to fan it. Let it cool down. Think about what it's done. All right. But first, let's look at this. So I said living things produce CO2, and I study CO2 coming out of soil. So do you see any living things, you, Abby, in this sample of soil? Anything crawling around in there? Anything moving? No, yeah, I don't see anything moving either. Okay, so Abby says, there's no living things in the soil. So when we put this instrument on it, should we see any CO2 coming out? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I guess it yes, but you said no. Because, because sure. okay, you're not sure. Well, if there's no living things, then there's nothing to produce it, right? Yes, but okay. I saw a plastic container. Oh, but yeah. the plastic container, that's a good thought. The soil has it in it. It's probably already released. You think it already released it? It always releases it when there's a bunch of soil, but it probably already released it in that little bit of soil. But maybe. Maybe. Okay. Do you have a thought? Uh, I think it might be microscopic moving organisms. Okay. All right. Okay. So let's watch the amount of carbon dioxide change, see if it goes up or not, even though we don't see any living things in this soil. All right. So right now, 
it's pretty high <laughs> because somebody had a really did a really good job breathing on it. Um, so I'm gonna make sure it goes down so that it actually will change. Oh, sorry guys, that was my phone. I got too close to the microphone. Okay, so right now the number is about 1,000. There's, there should not be a worm in here because I checked. You think I'm hiding something? Oh, you think there's going to be a worm and that's why it's going to go up? Okay, you're right. It's still dropping. Let's keep watching. 845. 824. Is there supposed to be going up? Sure is. Oh, it certainly is dropping. You know what we're going to do? I'm going to pour some water on it. Okay. Water does make stuff wet. All right, seven? <laughs> 79. <laughs> Guys, we're making a really important scientific discovery right now. It's going down. It is going down. Okay, 759. Okay, here's what normally happens when you put this on top of some soil. That number will go up, up, up. Thank you very much for volunteering. You guys are dismissed. Okay. Normally, you attach this to soil, and you measure the amount of, soil, of, of carbon dioxide coming out. And it goes up and up and up and up. Even though you can't see anything living in there. Right? So, as somebody up here in the brown jacket rightly said, that's because there are things living in the soil, even though we can't see them. They're just tiny, tiny. They're microorganisms. Bacteria, fungi, things like that, even other types of microorganisms. And they're producing carbon dioxide, but they're so tiny. So how do we even, how can we even measure that? Even though, you know, it's so small you can't see it, and it's breathing, its little breath is tiny compared to our breaths. But we can still measure it in the soil, and it's actually a huge, huge amount of carbon dioxide that comes out of the soil. Why is that? Yeah? It's not just one living being. It's a lot. Yes. Yes. It is so many, in fact, that there are more living things, even though they're sleeping right now, in that container of soil than there are people on the entire planet. Yes. It's so many microbes, and they're living in the soil, and they're breathing out carbon dioxide, and that is why the amount of carbon dioxide coming out of the soil is actually really quite high. Okay. Okay, so really quick, I just want to wrap up by talking a little bit about what it's like to be a scientist. Being a scientist is really cool. Every day is very different. I get to do things like going out in the woods and setting up experiments and spending time in the lab, analyzing samples, and being really careful. What I didn't put on here, but I do a lot, is I spend time on my computer writing reports about what I've learned so I can share that with other people. I get to travel a lot as a scientist. I get to sample soil in beautiful places like the Rocky Mountains. I get to look at gas coming out of permafrost melting in the Arctic. Sometimes I get to talk to people about what I do, like I'm doing right now today. I get to spend time in the woods looking at all kinds of beautiful fungi, plants, and animals, salamanders, yep, and sometimes, and newts, in fact, sometimes animals even participate in my research, like the curious bear who destroyed my soil moisture sensors, or the snake that wanted to measure leaf litter decomposition with me that day. So sometimes there are some challenges to being a scientist, but you don't have to be a scientist to support your soil and to do things to care for your soil. So the first thing that you can all do to help soil in your own backyard is when the leaves fall every autumn, you can leave them there. You can tell your parents, let's stay inside and drink hot chocolate instead of going out to rake those leaves because they are gonna decompose and add organic matter to the soil. Yep. Um, would it help 
if he like mulched the leaves, because then it would like they would decompose faster. Because that's a Tucker, leaf. what a good idea. Yes, you can mulch the leaves. That will help them break down even faster and become soil organic matter. I love that idea. Absolutely, leave them, mulch them. Don't just pile them away. You can add organic matter to soil by composting your kitchen scraps. They're going to break down. They're going to put nutrients in there for the plants. Recycle that material. You can plant trees and shrubs, which are going to take carbon dioxide out of the air, putting that into your soil. And you can respect all those animals that are living underneath our feet. Because even though we don't see them all the time, they're doing really important work. They're down there turning over nutrients and keeping um, our earth healthy and allowing plants to grow. So if you see a little worm on the sidewalk, maybe you put it in the grass, something like that. Even though they're slimy, they're very important. Okay, thank you very much for your time today. Have so much fun talking to you.